Anyway, let's scoot into the lesson. Uh, lesson five, remain faithful to your idea. Tonight we have the fifth and last lesson in this course. First, I shall give you a sort of summary of what has gone before. Then, since so many of you have asked me to elaborate further on lesson three, I shall give you a few more ideas on thinking fourth dimensionally. I know that when a man sees a thing clearly, he can tell it, he can explain it. This past winter in Barbados, a fisherman, whose vocabulary would not encompass a thousand words, told me more in five minutes about the behavior of the dolphin than Shakespeare with his vast vocabulary could have told me if he did not know the habits of the dolphin. This fisherman told me how the dolphin loves to play on a piece of driftwood, and in order to catch him, you throw the wood out and bait him as you would bait children, because he likes to pretend he is getting out of the water. As I said, this man's vocabulary was very limited, but he knew his fish, and he knew the sea. Because he knew his dolphin, he could tell me all about their habits and how to catch them. When you say you know a thing, but you cannot explain it, I say you do not know it. For when you really know it, you naturally express it. If I should ask you now to define prayer and say to you, how would you, through prayer, go about realizing an objective, any objective? If you can tell me, then you know it. But if you cannot tell me, then you do not know it. When you see clearly in the mind's eye, the greater you will inspire the words, which are necessary to clothe the idea and express it beautifully. And you will express the idea far better than a man with a vast vocabulary who does not see it as clearly as you do. Uh, which, by the way, you should also keep in mind that you're going to have a personal, you have a, or maybe a whole, you know, for me, I tend to have like a whole little group of them, preferred methods, preferred ways that you really imagine um, to capture the state you want to express. Um, but what Neville is encouraging here, here, uh, encouraging you to really do here uh, is to know that so intimately that you could explain your personal method to anybody and that you could do it, you could apply it, you know, just naturally, automatically towards whatever you wanted. And I think it is very, very, very important um, for people who are more experienced conscious manifestors to examine, this is the heuristic video I did, examine the, all the ways that you have successfully manifested consciously and unconsciously. Well, not unconsciously, but pre-consciously. Like when you, when you aren't doing it in, in, with, with intent, uh, with a, aware intent. Look at all the ways you have successfully expressed something, either that you want to express or that you don't want to express, um, and see which is the most effective way for you which way is the most natural to your mind. Uh, you can do it right now towards anything and know you're going to get it. Um, if you can identify that thing for yourself right now, that is definitely some homework. Um, whether it would be trying out more, more sort of what we call techniques, movements in mind, um, in order to find the one that's most effective for you, or to just simply think more about how um, you have achieved your life so far, uh, both things that were intentional and unintentional, but you know, they're a goal you wanted to obtain. If you have listened carefully throughout the past four days, you know now that the Bible has no reference at all to any persons that ever existed or to any events that ever occurred upon earth. The authors of the Bible were not writing history. They were writing a great drama of the mind, which they dressed up in the garb of history and then adapted it to the limited capacity of the uncritical, unthinking masses. You know that every story in the Bible is your story, that when the writer introduces dozens of characters in the same, same story, they are trying to present you with different attributes of the mind that you may employ. You saw it as I took perhaps a dozen or more stories and interpreted them for you. All right, Neville, it was only like five. <laughs> you didn't do a dozen. For instance, many people wonder how Jesus, the most gracious, the most loving man in the world, if he be man, could say to his mother what he is supposed to have said to her as recorded in the second chapter of the Gospel of St. John. Jesus is made to say to his mother, Woman, what have I to do with thee? You and I, who are not yet identified with the ideal we serve, 
would not make such a statement to our mother. Yet here was the embodiment of love, saying to his mother, Woman, what have I to do with thee? You are Jesus, and your mother is your own consciousness. For the consciousness is the cause of all, therefore it is the great father-mother of all phenomena. You and I are creatures of habit. We get into the habit of accepting as final the evidence of our senses. Wine is needed for the guest, and my senses tell me that there is no wine, and I through habit am about to accept this lack as final. When I remember that my consciousness is the one and only reality, therefore if I deny the evidence of my senses and assume the consciousness of having sufficient wine, I have in a sense rebuked my mother or the consciousness which suggested lack. And by assuming the consciousness of having what I desire for my guests, wine is produced in a way we do not know. Uh, before we go further into this, I wanted to also share another thought I had had today, which is I was put off at first, and I can see why a lot of people would be put off by um, Neville's reliance on the Bible and talking about Jesus and talking about God. And... Well, you know, it's very personal, but if you have sort of that negative history uh, with religious people um, or with religion in general, as I think more and more contemporary people do, which I certainly did personally, um, that's why we have the, uh, that's also why I have the LGBT tag on here, because I want for any, uh, anyone like that who finds this channel to be like, oh no, we're not, <laughs> this is not a hateful, it's not a hate space, you know. Because I think a lot, of those, a lot of those spaces fell into uh, finding excuses for hateful behavior. And that's not at all what is being discussed, you know. But so my point is, Neville is also very clear, as he just said, that all these characters are symbols. And literally everyone you know is a symbol. And all symbols are God, your true self, revealing you to you. So you have to think of these things as, well... Jesus at the core, what does that character, that person, mean and symbolize? Because if you're from a Western society, hell, even if you're probably from an Eastern society, you know generally the story of Jesus, right? Uh, even if you were not raised Christian, you know the story. And you know the character, you know the figure, you know the symbolism of it. And you know that at the core, what this figure and character is, is God represented as a person and called the Son because it's still considered a separate emanation from the Father, but also not separate because he can do all the acts of the Father. Well, this symbol is meant to be you. This is you. This is what you are. This is how you behave. This is the world that you create, and this is your character. Your very self is this Jesus Christ character. And then you can look at all the other little stories that occurred to Jesus, including the most prominent being like the resurrection or the birth. Um, you know, he's talking about giving the people the wine here, uh, you know, multiplying the fish and loaves. You can look at any of those and apply it um, to your personal mental processes, how you create your world, um, you know, the movements in mind that you make, uh, how they express and then how you react to them. These are all stories you're telling yourself to understand the relationship between your mind and your so-called exterior world and all the people and all the things in it. So Jesus is this core symbol that you're using to explain this relationship to yourself. Because we as humans have decided, well, like our God self decided that humans really like stories. They just fucking love stories. And the Jesus story is the primary way you explain your imaginative power to yourself. Um, having that as a basis, I think, is very important, and it takes away any unfortunate negative stigma that got put upon these symbols in your personal life. Um, and that is kind of a crucial step. Until I did that mentally, um, I was having trouble listening to and reading some of these lectures because there were associations with, you know, you just mean people, right? Uh, and, you know, with, you know, things like, you know, being 
um, you know, just being excluded or being considered a sinner and crap like that. Uh, but once you detach that from it and understand it in this light, which is all Neville is encouraging you and telling you to do, um, you can read more of these lectures and you can actually, you know, read the Bible if you want and understand more of what you're really trying to tell yourself. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Just because what made me think of that is I had seen a, um, uh, some random um, videos, and I am glad more people are doing this, but I had been recommended some manifesting videos by two people I'd never seen before, and they both really boldly started talking about the Spirit of Christ in you, and I right away noticed how that could be off-putting because it was off-putting to a portion of me that hadn't totally died out yet. And I realize how it can immediately, boom, turn people off. Um, and I'm hoping that whoever finds my YouTube channel, you're not put off in that way because it's not none of it is meant that way. And, you know, th so many people got this so totally wrong. And Neville is teaching you the correction, which you're really trying to tell yourself here. Okay, I have just read a note here from a dear friend of mine in the audience. Last Sunday, he had an appointment at a church for a wedding. The clock told him he was late. Everything told him he was late. He was standing on a street corner waiting for a streetcar. There was none in sight. He imagined that instead of being on the street corner, he was in the church. At that moment, a car stopped in front of him. My friend told the driver his predicament and the driver said to him, I'm not going that way, but I will take you there. My friend got into the car and was at the church in time for the service. That is applying the law correctly. Non-acceptance of the suggestion of lateness. Never accept the suggestion of lack. And this is the thing that, um, you know, I struggle with. Anybody new to the law will struggle with, even once you've manifested a bunch of stuff, just because who hasn't been conditioned to believe that the exterior world is separate from you? That it has its that it's basically a chaos <laughs> that you have no control over, um, so you just have to react as best as you can. It's I mean what the this the 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 schematic of reality that we've been taught and conditioned to think all our thoughts from is totally opposite to what's going on. So it, it's normal. It's totally normal and totally fine for you to recalibrate that. That's that's what the waking up process is. That's what's going on here. But, you know, look, so many times uh, I've done it, and I know you've all done it too, we imagine for something. Week goes by, months goes by. You maybe imagine for it a bunch of times. Even years go by. You see nothing. You see no movement. Okay? Your mind starts to react to that. It's, if you've been waiting years for something, your mind's been reacting the whole time. And it started telling you things like, Nothing's happening. <laughs> Where is it? Uh, the, all of those thoughts, those thoughts have to be discarded too. Because you couldn't ask where is it once you already have it. So, like, okay, let's apply it to a job. Uh, if you have the job you want, it is as easy if you already have a job you want right now, right? How many times have you asked this week, when am I going to get the job? What do you mean? You've been in this job for two years now. How can you ask when are you going to get the job? Uh, relationship. If you want to be married to somebody. you're already If you're already married to them, how many times are you going to ask, uh, you know, when are they going to text me? Or when are we going to go on a date? You're married to them. You're going to see them tonight. <laughs> you know, if you, you wouldn't even be asking when are they going to text me. You're married to them. If you text them right now, they're going to text you back as soon as they possibly can, right? So, like, the, the thoughts that get created that are from, they're reacting to the lack, they're just so totally foreign to the thoughts you would have once the thing is already manifested out, you know? And noticing those and correcting those, um, ignoring, like, not being emotionally moved by them, not identifying with them, that is part of the key of persistence. And it's just the thing we've got to learn. It's well, a thing we've got to remember how to do um, and train and condition ourselves to do that. 
instead of what we've been doing, which just perpetuates, um, you know, longer unfoldings and lack of what you need and want, blah, blah, blah. In this case, I say to myself, what have I to do with thee? What have I to do with the evidence of my senses? Bring me all the pots and fill them. In other words, I assume that I have wine and all that I desire. Then my dimensionally greater self inspires in all the thoughts and the actions which aid the embodiment of my assumption. So you look at the apparent lack and you say, this is not, this is not me, this is not who I am. Um, if, if they're not, uh, if you were declined the job two months ago, <laughs> you don't care about any of that. You've already got the job. You're there. You look by the time you're by the time you're in a uh, a job or a house you want, you know, house apartment, whatever uh, relationship. Once a couple years has passed, I don't know about y'all, but I don't remember the details of how the shit happened. <laughs> like I don't remember the unfolding. You know, I would have to look. I might remember a little piece here and there. It's some important moment, but to know all the details of the unfolding, I'd have to go back and like look at pictures, look at journals, and I still then wouldn't have the total unfolding, you know, put into place. So once you're in it, once you've got it, you don't even remember the unfolding. You know, it's literally not important. You've got the job, you've got the marriage, you've got the body you want, you've got the house you want to live in, you've got the car, you've got the money, you've got the whatever. You know, do you remember signing the check? Do you remember, you know, your day at work a year ago? Um, like, do you remember your third or fourth date, unless it was a very special and important one? No, you don't remember any of that shit. You don't. You just know that this is now part of who you are. I'm going to read that paragraph again, though, because it has within it, you know, Neville's key to how we mentally do this. In this case, I say to myself... What have I, my identity, to do with thee, the exterior world, claiming that you don't have this thing? What do you? What is your relationship between these two? And in that movement, you're denying it. Well, that ha that's not me. That's not who I am. What have I to do with the evidence of my senses? Bring me all the pots and fill them. In other words, I assume that I have wine and all that I desire. Then my dimensionally greater self inspires in all the thoughts and the actions which aid the embodiment of my assumption. It is not a man saying to a mother, like Jesus saying that to Mary, that's not what happens. What actually happens is you. It is not a man saying to a mother, woman, what, I, what have I to do with thee? It is every man or woman person who knows this law, who will say to him, her, their self, when their senses suggest lack, what have I to do with thee? Get behind me. I will never again listen to a voice like that, because if I do, then I am impregnated by that suggestion, and I will bear the fruit of lack. Uh, this is the core prob This is the core issue. Um, eh. Oh my God, I'm having trouble highlighting it. Sorry. Got it. I will. Never again listen to a voice like that, because if I do, then I am impregnated by that suggestion, and I will bear the fruit of lack. We turn to another story in the Gospel of St. Mark where Jesus is hungry, and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon, and when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it, like, Wow, fuck this tree. <laughs> and in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. <laughs> it was bad hungry. Uh, what tree am I blasting? Not a tree on the outside. It is my own consciousness. I am the vine. My consciousness, my I amness is the great tree. And habit once more suggests emptiness. It suggests barrenness. It suggests four months before I can feast. But I cannot wait four months. 
I give myself this power suggestion. I give myself this powerful suggestion that never again will I even for a moment uh, believe. It says relieve, but it should be believe. Believe that it will take four months to realize my desire. The belief in lack must from this day on be barren and never again reproduce itself in my mind. It is not a man blasting a tree. Everything in the Bible takes place in the mind of man. The tree, the city, the people, everything. This is not a statement made in the Bible that does not represent some attribute of the human mind. They are all personifications of the mind and not things within the world. So to clarify too, in case anyone is a little bit um, having trouble with the older language. So Jesus is hungry, uh, sees a tree in the distance that he knows to be a fig tree. And thinks, hey, there might be some figs on there. Goes up, it doesn't have figs, and he's like, "Fuck this tree." <laughs> nobody's ever gonna. If I can't eat off this tree, nobody's ever gonna eat off this tree. Even though it wasn't even the time when it's supposed to have figs, and the disciples heard this, and then the next day they see the tree, and it's just dead, totally dead. Um, so. Neville says, blasting the tree. It's like, just boom, fuck this tree. <laughs> and this is a, a, a symbol for these, um, these thoughts of identifying with lack, sympathizing with lack, appropriating lack. Any of these thoughts that come up, you boom, blast them like you did that tree. Like, fuck these thoughts, fuck this tree in particular. <laughs> uh, and there's the idea, too, of like, it's not going to proliferate again. So, like, I'm never going to have these thoughts again about anything ever. I'm never going to have these thoughts of lack. Like, take, like killing that at its root. You know, not just for any particular desire you have. Because, you know, sometimes a desire will produce a ton of thoughts of lack. You know, because you, every day you might not notice it there. Well, this idea is not just out, uprooting that and all its subsequent thoughts. But all subsequent thoughts across anything you want to manifest. Uh, saying like you're just not going to give that attention. You're not going to spend, waste the coin of heaven on lack anymore. You know, just forever blast that from your consciousness. Um, I give myself. I want to reread re -read this part. I give myself this powerful suggestion that never again will I even for a moment believe that it will take four months to realize my desire the belief in lack must from this day on be barren and never again reproduce itself in my mind uh, consciousness is the one and only reality there is no one to whom we can turn after we discover that our own awareness is God for God is the cause of all and there is nothing but God you cannot say that a devil causes some things and God others. Listen to these words. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunders the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness, and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, and the God of Israel. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let go of my captives. Not for price, nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. I am the Lord, and there is no one else. There is no God beside me. Read these words carefully. They are not my words. They are the inspired words of men who discovered that consciousness is the only reality. If I am hurt, I am self-hurt. If there is darkness in my world, I created the darkness and the gloom and the depression. If there is light and joy, I created the light and joy. There is no one but this I amness that does all. Uh, and I mean, these are pretty. These are some pretty dense sentiments, 
But they're all just saying that God does everything and God is your very awareness of being or your imagination. So it does, it does everything. Uh, your very awareness of being is the creative force. Uh, you cannot find a cause outside of your own consciousness. Your world is a grand mirror, constantly telling you who you are. As you meet people, they tell you by their behavior who you are. Um, also, I wanted to mention one thing really quickly, too, because um, this is about uh, non-dualism. So evil things, uh, negative things, toxic things, to use a contemporary phrase, uh, these are all also God's creations and God itself being expressed. Um, so the one of the primary tenets of non-dualism is that there's never separation. God is never separate uh, from the creation, and things that we would see as abhorrent are just as divine and godlike as things that we would venerate. Um, this is a foundational teaching. It's something that's kind of hard to grasp, especially if you've come from a stance where there are things that are godly and things that are sins or whatever. But this is the incorrect understanding. Um, I mean, obviously, if a thing is present in your world, as unlovely as it may seem to you, it is just as much God as the most beautiful thing that you can think of in your reality. Um, and because God is no, as Neville says, no respecter of persons and neutral force, you are allowed to identify with and express anything. So I am allowed to identify with and express suffering from migraines for decades if I want to. I am allowed to do that. I am not forbidden to do that. However, I am also allowed to say, I just stopped getting migraines and have that expressed if I truly identify with it. So it works every which way. You know, there is no moralistic code that you're being forced to adhere to. Um, you're allowed to identify with and manifest absolutely anything you want. So that's what this is talking about here. Okay. Let's reread this bit. You cannot find a cause outside of your own consciousness. Your world is a grand mirror, constantly telling you who you are. As you meet people, they tell you by their behavior who you are. Your prayers will not be less devout because you turn to your own consciousness for help. I do not think that any person in prayer feels more of the joy, the piety, and the feeling of adoration than I do when I feel thankful, as I assume the feeling of my wish fulfilled. Knowing at the same time, it is to myself that I turned. In prayer, you are called upon to believe that you possess what your reason and your senses deny. When you pray, believe that you have and you shall receive. The Bible states it this way. Therefore, I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, which is equivalent to forgetting, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. In other words, you can hold a behavior in place of yourself or of another person or of an incident. Um, whatever thing you're thinking about there, as long as you're holding it in consciousness, it's going to perpetuate and express. You have to forgive it. In other words, forget it. A practical way to do this would be to revise whatever happened, revise the person's behaviors, or come up with an affirmation thinking about how they act now. Think about how you're treated now or how you act now, which would nullify the prior, the prior experience. And then that will replicate. The new thing will replicate. But until you do that mentally, the thing will keep replicating. That is uh, what we must do when we pray. If I hold something against another, be it a belief of sickness, poverty, or anything else, I must loose it and let it go. Not by using words of denial, but by believing him to be what he desires to be. In that way, I completely forgive him. I changed my concept of him. I had aught against him, and I forgave him. Complete forgetfulness is forgiveness. If I do not forget, then I have not forgiven. I only forgive something when I truly forget. 
I can say to you until the end of time, I forgive you. But if every time I see you or think of you, I am reminded of what I held against you, I have not forgiven you at all. Forgiveness is complete forgetfulness. Uh, you go to a doctor and he gives you something for your sickness. He is trying to take it from you, so he gives you something in place of it. Give yourself a new concept of self for the old concept. Give up the old concept completely. A prayer granted implies that something is done in consequence of the prayer, which otherwise would not have been done. Therefore, I myself am the spring of action, the directing mind, and the one who grants the prayer. Anyone who prays successfully turns within and appropriates the state sought. You have no sacrifice to offer. Do not let anyone tell you that you must struggle and suffer. You need not struggle for the realization of your desire. Read what it says in the Bible. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacri sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of goats. When ye come before me, who hath required that at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no vain oblations, incense is an abomination unto me, uh, the new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Ye shall have a song as in the night, when a holy solemnity is kept, and gladness of heart, as when one goeth with a pipe, to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel. Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise from the end of the earth. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains of forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, um, the supplanter, the symbol of desire, and glorified himself in Israel. Uh, if, we, if you uh, see in lesson two or three, uh, it was one of the recountings of, or explanations of Jacob and Esau, if you want to refresh on that. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. An everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. The only acceptable gift is a joyful heart. Come with singing and praise. That is the way to come before the Lord, your own consciousness. Assume the feeling of your wish fulfilled, and you have brought the only acceptable gift. All states of mind other than that of the wish fulfilled, are an abomination. They are superstition and mean nothing. You could unpack this. I mean, this could be so many things uh, that you're doing or trying to do or have done, trying to get something you want. And Neville is playing that none of that's going to get you what you want. The only thing that's going to get you what you want is the state of mind, the state of consciousness of already having it. That's the only thing that will lead to the manifestation or at least having that as the dominant state if it's not crowded out all the others if you haven't forgiven everything which means forget everything else at least it's dominant but keep in mind any trouble you let remain in your mind will express um, we're gonna have to wrap up in a second so I, before i do i wanted to also um, go back over the forgetfulness section um, so in Pretty Sure is a Revision, vision, Forgiveness is also discussed, and I just clipped that up. It's now up on YouTube if anybody wants to encounter this same thing said again. Um, I mean, this is the absolute summary of what Neville says about forgiveness. And when he talks about manifesting for other people, um, whether that's forgiving something they did or forgiving a condition they're in that they don't want to be in, the way he talks about it is when you forgive that person, your sense of self that animated that in them has to die. Uh, we'll eventually do The Art of Dying, where he uses some Blake quotes and talks about this at a greater uh, extent in a lot more eloquent manner. But essentially, when you're imagining for another person, you're giving up on the you that saw them this way. And you're giving up on that version of you so completely and intensely that it no longer exists, that you no longer identify with being the you that saw them this way. 
Uh, that's what you're really doing. You're forgetting who you were so that they can be redeemed. Um, okay, so I have got to end it. Let me scoot back to... I have got to end it early today because i got to go do errands. So we weren't even able to get to... Um, we are able to get to page 5, but that's okay. So I'll probably need two more... Um, two more uh, streams to finish up um, this particular lecture uh, or lesson but I mean I think just a little bit I've done today uh, will offer plenty of plenty of room for um, room for reflection for and I mean look frankly some of those phrases that are in this lesson are so powerful that they might have been the final push you needed to let go of those lackful thoughts that are coming up again and again for the big thing you want or a couple of the big things you want. You might even be able to now say, you know what, I don't need that pattern ever again. I've manifested enough stuff. I know the law works. I know who I am. I know what I've claimed. I don't need to identify with thoughts of lack ever again and just boom, <laughs> blast and burn that fig tree you will never produce in your mind again. Uh, I talked about in I think the heuristic video the idea that, you know, when it comes to our imaginal acts, we can apply them towards our minds. Um, we can apply them towards our identity as manifestors. So you can imagine telling someone, oh, I never focus on the lack. I never even fucking notice it. I'm always in, you know, the state of the wish fulfilled. And if I ever falter from that, I just forget it. I just drop that shit immediately and move back into the state of fulfillment. Um, and it's one of these things where it's like something I struggle with is being results oriented versus like actually getting to enjoy the state before it happens. Because some part of me is so old man, and I know you all have experienced this too, where it's like you're so conditioned to not enjoy it until you get it. And so it almost feels like mm, not a betray. It just feels like the wrong thing to do to be happy about something you don't have yet. You know, and in so many ways that that can manifest. But, you know, if you think about it in a more um, joyful light, you're actually being allowed to celebrate something for a much longer period of time um, and in a much, like, greater and deeper uh, extent than you do when you just, oh, I have the thing I'm happy for a day. Like, you get to be happy about it, like, all the time. <laughs> you know, you get to be happy about it whenever you think about it, whenever... You know, whenever your mind moves towards this thing, you get to be happy about it now and before it ever happens. Like that's, I think that's a, that's actually a gift we've given ourselves, not a trial and tribulation. Um, oh, there was also one quote. I'll try to remember her to highlight it again on stream. Uh, last time it was about the suffering, uh, and that was also relevant today. Let me, one second, let me find it. Okay, you have no sacrifice to offer. Do not let anyone tell you that you must struggle and suffer. You need not struggle for the realization of your desire. The only acceptable gift is a joyful heart. All right, I think that's it for today. I will see you all again tomorrow. It might be another short stream. Um, or, you know, I might be able to get through the whole thing tomorrow. We'll see. Uh, but either way, it'll be sometime uh, probably in, in the afternoon. Uh, but before this time of day. Uh, more like 3.30 or 4 o'clock Central Standard Time. All right, thanks for tuning in. I will see you all again next time.